Good afternoon and uh, welcome to Asthma Grand Rounds, the first uh, of uh, our 2013-2014 series. I'm pleased to have you uh, join us here both in the amphitheater and those of you who are joining us by live webcasting. Welcome. It's my great pleasure to introduce our speaker today, Dr. Tanya Laidlaw, who's a member of Partners Asthma Center, a member of the Allergy Group here, where she heads the Translational Research Group and also has developed a center for uh, uh, aspirin exacerbated respiratory disease. She does our aspirin challenges. She's involved with our aspirin desensitizations. And today she's going to share with us some novel insights into the pathogenesis of aspirin exacerbated respiratory disease. We're delighted to have Dr. Tanya Laidlaw join us. Thank you. So I have the opportunity and the delight to be able to talk to you about aspirin exacerbated respiratory disease, which goes by many other names, and I'll stick with AERD for simplicity, not because it's a better name, it's just what we're sort of leaning towards these days. For no particularly obvious reason, I seem to have decided that I'm going to dedicate my life's work to the diagnosis and the treatment and the understanding of AERD, which may in fact have been a poor career choice since it's pretty hard to diagnose, sometimes kind of risky to do so. Our treatments don't work very well, and those that do are riddled with side effects, and nobody understands anything about the disease. <laughs> so that being said, there's a lot of wide open stuff to learn. So I'm going to start today, we're going to look forward first into making sure that everyone knows how to recognize and diagnose the clinical disease. If we don't know what it is, you can't study it. If we don't know who the patients are, you can't help them. So what does it look like? What does it look like in classic presentations? What are the little exceptions you need to know about? And we'll do this with the help of a quick case. Then I'm going to move into what is the mechanism? What, what do we know about AERD? You know, it's these sort of biochemical mysteries, these riddles that are mostly unsolved. And I'm pretty sure that eventually the puzzle pieces will all fit together into a beautiful picture. But right now, none of them seem to fit anywhere. And we're trying to get that together. So with the addition of some um, information we've known already from laboratory findings and our own findings on what we think the pro-inflammatory role of the platelet is in this disease, I'm going to sort of try to throw together with two slides what a cohesive mechanism might be, might be, it's theoretical, to explain what happens in these reactions. And then bumping off that cohesive mechanism idea where we kind of blame the platelet for a lot of it is a clinical trial that is now led by doctors Josh Boyce and Elliot Israel at the Asthma Research Center here, where we're sort of fighting against the platelet in case that's going to help us. And I'll go through what that is doing, what we think it's doing, what we hope it's doing, and what some other future targets of therapeutic control might be. So AERD presents in adulthood, usually young adults, usually young 20s, sometimes 30s. And it's this very bizarre and yet very stereotyped common phenotype. So although individually the patients have very strange symptoms, they all have the same strange symptoms. Generally speaking, it happens over a period of weeks to months. So last Christmas I was fine, this Labor Day I'm really sick and I don't know what happened in there. In that period of time I've developed asthma, I've developed nasal polyps, and I've developed these bizarro respiratory reactions that I'll describe to COX-1 inhibitors and specifically to aspirin after which the disease is named. Now, there are a couple of very unique things about this. First of all, developing bad asthma all of a sudden when you're 24 is a little weird anyway. You usually either had it as a kid or it just kind of has continued to peter on in your life. Secondly, although not every single patient with AERD actually has asthma, the vast majority of them do, and their respiratory disease tends to be severe. The average FEV1 of these patients is lower than aspirin-tolerant asthmatics, and the, it accounts for a disproportionate uh, proportion of severe asthmatics. The nasal polyp portion of the respiratory disease is always severe, and that's really one of the main clinical points I want you guys to take home. Really bad nasal polyps that grow back quickly kill your sense of smell, and grow back within even sometimes weeks of surgery. I've never seen anything do that except AERD. And then the reactions to aspirin and COX-1 inhibitors. So before you get to that point, you're just some poor guy who has asthma and a lot of sinus disease. You're not even interesting. No one knows what's wrong with you. The day you take your ibuprofen, your Aleve, your aspirin, 
and you develop the reaction that I'll describe, that's when you all of a sudden complete your triad with the three things, asthma, nasal polyps, and reaction. That's when your diagnosis happens. So you'll note that I'm going to talk later about this. One of the trickiest things is that if you're one of those people who just doesn't need medications, like I don't know anyone out like that, but they exist. You just don't take medications. If you don't take asthma, uh, aspirin, Aleve, or Motrin ever, you're just a guy with nasal polyps and asthma. You don't know what you have. You have it, you just don't know it. So you have to do that for diagnosis. How common is it? The answer to this question is always a lot more common than you think it is. So it depends on how you ask the question. If you ask it as a self-reported question, do you have asthma, do you have nasal polyps, and do you have an aspirin allergy, you can only know that answer if you've taken aspirin. If you haven't taken aspirin, you don't know if you have an aspirin allergy. So what if you have an ibuprofen allergy? Well, that counts too, but if we didn't ask it that way, we won't know. At the end of the day, the answer is probably about 5 to 10% of adults with asthma have this which is a lot more common than we thought. And about 25 to 30% of adults who have asthma and nasal polyps have this. It's somewhere between one and two million adults in the United States. All right, so this is Dan. He was one of my early patients from years ago. He was about 37 when I first met him. He's a sweet guy, has two little girls. When I met him, he was 37. He had never had ATP. He was never an allergic person. He had no childhood asthma, no childhood allergies. He's a football player. In college, he was completely healthy. You know, every now and then he got some congestion, felt short of breath in the fields, but generally speaking, he's totally healthy. Took Advil all the time for muscle aches, no problems. Graduates from college, when within a couple of months, all of a sudden realizes he has asthma, is diagnosed. That then progresses to develop constant rhinitis and nasal congestion, and he loses his sense of smell. He goes to at least three allergists who test him for everything they can think of, and he's totally negative. He doesn't actually have allergies, but he looks like he should have allergies. He's sneezing, he's wheezing all the time. He finally sees an ENT surgeon at 24 who says he's full of polyps, completely impacted, every sinus cavity full of polyps. Has his first polyp surgery at 25, and six months later, he's no better. They're all back. He develops worsening asthma despite doing all of the medications appropriately he's given. And then when he's 26, he takes an Alka-Seltzer which happens to have a full 325 milligrams of aspirin within it. He actually took it for his nasal congestion, which is the irony of that. Two to three hours later, he gets much worse nasal congestion. Now he's sneezing, he has chest tightness, and he has some wheezing. He takes a few puffs of valbuterol and he feels better. Didn't make the connection between the Alka-Seltzer and the sneezing and the wheezing because it was three hours later. A few months later, he takes three tablets of ibuprofen. An hour later, he gets watery eyes, congestion, cough, wheezing, not relieved by many puffs of albuterol, calls 911, gets himself into the emergency room, gets continuous albuterol meds and IV steroids. Thankfully, the ER physician did pick up on that and made the connection to the back one. So now we have COX-1 inhibitor number one, aspirin, COX-1 inhibitor number two, ibuprofen, causing these very classic reactions that we'll go through. Even now, knowing what he had, no one knew what to do with him. So he went on to have repeat polyp surgeries at 27, at 33, and at 37. I had seen, he had had a surgery about four months before I met him. He was already full of polyps by the time I saw him. When I met him, he was on Advair 550, Montelukast, steroid sprays up his nose constantly, neti potty things as much as he could, loratadine, albuterol he needed all the time. He had zero sense of smell or taste. His antibiotics were required for sinusitis several times a year, and his polyps, as I said, were already back. Side note, don't ever blow off someone's lack of sense of smell. It's a horrible, horrible experience. Not tasting food for your entire life is a miserable place to be. So it probably won't kill you, but it's a really, really awful symptom for patients. Okay, so that's a very classic presentation. So he had adult onset asthma, recurrent nasal polyps, and respiratory reactions to two COX-1 inhibitors. Shame on anyone in the room who can't correctly diagnose that. That's right in front of you. Those are the easy ones, at least to diagnose. So we get into even knowing what he has, what does that mean? So we know a lot about what ARD isn't. It's not a classic allergy to aspirin. There's no IgE antibody to it. There's no Mendelian inheritance pattern. Your mom didn't have it, your kids won't have it. And it's not a childhood disease, and I just had to kind of breaks my heart, put in the little exceptions parenthetic clause. It is classically in young adults, 20s, 30s, 40s. I've had a few patients who in retrospect probably developed it in their late teens, one kid when he was 15. Last Wednesday morning, I spent an hour on the phone with an allergist who actually trained here, who's now at Cincinnati Children's Hospital. And he was flabbergasted because he has a patient who's a girl 
who's now gone through one, maybe even two nasal polyp surgeries, has very bad asthma, developed in the last year or two, is on high dose inhaled oral steroids, was actually challenged to aspirin drop traffic V1 classic reaction and is desensitized to aspirin and is a mess. The only thing interesting about her is that she's nine and her symptoms developed when she was eight. That's definitely the youngest that I have ever heard of. And so if you're miserable at 39 with this, I have no idea what it's like to be a nine-year-old. So I have to, unfortunately, modify my slides a little bit. It turns out it is usually an adult disease, but we need to start watching out for the younger patients as well. So although it's not inherited, you kind of develop it out of the blue. There's no obvious environmental trigger that we know of. There are no kind of epidemiologic sort of pockets of people that all got the same toxin. And there's no obvious infection. If it was contagious, I would have it, because they all sneeze on me. And I don't. So your husband didn't get it when you got it. Your kids didn't get it when you got it. It's not obviously simply a toxin or uh, an infection. And it's not transient. So the bummer for the nine-year-old is that when she's 39, she'll still have it. When she's 89, she'll still have it. Once you get the disease, it does not go away. It may wax and wane, but it does not go away. So some little clinical themes for the patients that we've gone over. They almost universally have tolerated aspirin and NSAIDs in the past, so they're not just born allergic to these medications. And as well, it doesn't cause the disease. For patients who have never, ever taken a COX-1 inhibitor in their entire life, they have the disease. They just don't know it yet. It doesn't cause it. So now that they have it, every single COX-1 inhibitor is unsafe in any dose. Even very low doses can cause a reaction. In fact, to aspirin, usually it's only 81 milligrams or 162 milligrams of aspirin that cause a reaction. As weird as that is, it's amenable to desensitization. So you can start very slowly in increasing doses and get the patients to tolerate the aspirin. And then, and we'll talk about this too, high dose aspirin is often therapeutic, which is sort of a bizarre piece of those riddles that we don't quite understand. All right. So the classic reactions to NSAIDs are upper respiratory um, nasoocular reactions and bronchoconstriction. So wheezing, coughing, drop in FEV1, sneezing, headaches, rhinorrhea, sort of I just got a cold five minutes ago kind of feelings. Less commonly, we do get rashes, sometimes swelling. I've never, never seen it in the clinic. Every now and then, low blood pressure from a systemic reaction. And we do actually, we're seeing increasingly this abdominal pain and cramping. Sometimes actually causes diarrhea, rarely causes vomiting, but is part of the reaction, can be very painful. And the average time to the reaction is about an hour and a half after aspirin. So it's not like the kids with the peanut allergies. Five minutes into it, you see hives, you're done. You have to wait for hours to know whether or not they're gonna react. So it's sort of a investment in time to go through this. And as I said, any COX-1 inhibitor can cause the reaction. So we mostly warn patients about aspirin, ibuprofen, and naproxen. It's the three over-the-counter ones in this country you can get. Um, Catorlac is an IV um, or IM drug, and it actually ends up being a big problem. I've had a number of patients who, having their polyp surgery, they knew they had AERD and got Toral, got Catorlac on the PACU on the way out. So they got reintubated. Um, so this is a medication that you need to sort of make sure that your patients know what to say and to really teach the anesthesiologist not to give them that. All right, so this is how we diagnose it with an aspirin challenge. We do oral challenges in the United States. It's the gold standard for diagnosis. The reason we do it is because there's this published negative challenge rate of 15% saying that even a really good allergist who does this all the time is only right 85% of the time. And so you kind of need to know for sure what they have. The protocol is, for the most part, we start with half of a baby aspirin, just cut it in half. And it's 40.5 milligrams of aspirin, and every hour and a half to three hours, depending on the level of severity of the patient, you give them another dose. So before your next dose, you ask them, how do you feel? Are you good? If you're good, you get PFTs. If your PFTs are still normal, you get your next dose, fine. As soon as you have any reaction at all, upper respiratory, lower respiratory, or other, then we're done. We know that we just challenged you, you reacted, we, ha we understand. And we stop at 325 milligrams because if you haven't reacted by then, you're not going to. So who do we challenge? Patients like Dan, which is the most classic textbook presentation ever, he doesn't really need a challenge. You kind of know what he has. There's no reason to put him through this. There are a number of patients you just aren't sure about. And so you, everyone who has asthma and mesopolyps, everyone, you ask. Don't ask if you're allergic to aspirin. Ask, do you ever have a problem when you take aspirin, Advil, Aleve, or Motrin? That's what you ask. If the answer is yes, then fine, you keep going. If the answer is no, you're not done. Because the answer can be no, but the real answer is, well, I haven't taken any in 20 years, so I don't actually know. They need a challenge. You don't know the answer. The answer can be no, 
But then you need to know if they're on a medication that can block their reaction. Because it turns out there are medications that can pharmacologically block their reactions and fake you out into thinking they're not allergic to it. And I'll talk about what those are. Another no answer, and this is a sort of a weird one. There are patients who just are so sick at baseline, they don't see the difference. And I, I'm going to apologize for my sexism. It tends to be men in their 30s and 40s who have relatively bad asthma and constant nasal congestion. And you ask them, do you have any problems when you take aspirin? And blah, blah, blah. No, I don't. She's crazy. No, in fact, I took ibuprofen this morning, and I'm fine. Which is funny, because your FEV1 is 47% of normal, and you're wheezing. So let's investigate this a little further. Is it possible that over the last three hours after taking your ibuprofen, you actually have gotten worse? And if you still can't feel it, I sometimes will still force you to come in and do a challenge so that you have a bunch of doctors and a bunch of nurses staring at you to really make sure that we know that you're not reacting. All right, so the aspirin desensitization and putting them onto high-dose oral aspirin actually is exactly the same as the challenge, except you keep going. So that what you do that day is the same, except you don't stop. So you continue to give them 325 milligrams of aspirin. You desensitize them. They don't react again. You give them 650 milligrams of aspirin. And you can get them on to high doses of aspirin, so about 650 milligrams twice a day. You need to take it every day to maintain desensitization. If you come off of it for more than a couple of doses, usually, you will recreate the reactions, and it becomes quite dangerous. And the benefits only occur if aspirin's taken regularly. So as great as you feel on aspirin for three years, if it's worked for you the day you stop a week later, it will be like you never took it at all. So does it work? Right? Why do we do this? So it turns out that the, um, it had been that the only study out there really was um, uh, from John Stevenson out in Southern California in 1996. And they had this relatively large scale with um, many, many patients. But it was a little hard. It wasn't, you know, it's hard to placebo control aspirin. It wasn't clear who the controls were, et cetera. It was sort of, do you feel better, was kind of what they could do. And after six months of aspirin, about 67 or 70 percent of patients said that they were felt improved. After a year of aspirin, about 87 percent of patients said that they were improved. It was kind of a soft study. It's hard to really know for sure what difference it makes. Two more recent studies done by surgeons, but to their credit, they were small, but I think nicely done. And the first one took seven patients, um, seven AARD patients who were put on a very low dose of aspirin and seven patients who were on a high dose of aspirin after polyp surgery. 100% of the patients who were on a very low dose of aspirin, not enough to get them better, had their polyps back in a year. None of the patients who were on high dose had their polyps back in a year. That's pretty compelling. And then a similar study was that you know, 10 patients did not, they were not desensitized to aspirin. And of those 10, 80% of them, eight of them needed a revision surgery within two years, whereas zero of five who were given high-dose aspirin needed. So it does seem to work best to prevent the regrowth of polyps. And for patients who the regrowth of polyps causes their main trouble, in other words, after surgery, they're just better. Right? They get that six-week period before the polyps come back when they can smell, they can breathe, they have no infections, and often their asthma is a lot easier to control. They're just less inflamed. Those are the patients for whom it seems to work best. And especially for those patients, do it after surgery for a couple of reasons. One, if you already need another polyp surgery and I put you on aspirin, you have to stop the aspirin to get the surgery because no one wants to do surgery when you're on aspirin and then repeat the whole thing and we got nothing out of that. Two, um, the reactions to aspirin tend to be much less severe when you're after surgery. Somehow taking out all of the inflamed stuff just makes you better. And the, the daily aspirin dose um, is either 650 milligrams once a day or 650 milligrams twice a day. And it's about 50-50. So if you get better on it, we don't know which 50 you're going to be in, but it might be that you can come down to a lower dose. It might be that you need to be on the higher dose. We have no way to predict that. All right, so this is when we get into the science. This is the pathway of the metabolism of arachidonic acid and many of the mediators that we're familiar with in terms of the disease. And there are several pathways here that we know have been shown to be abnormal in disease, and I'll go through them. And there are four things in general that I'm going to talk about. The leukotrienes on the left, yeah. leukotrienes on the left, the production and function of PGE2 through the Cox pathway, thromboxane, and the role of the platelet. So on the left-hand side, are the leukotrienes, and this is the pathway to the production of leukotrienes. Now, we've known since the early 1990s from doctors Christi, Christy and Lee that patients with AERD way overproduce leukotrienes, both at baseline and further overproduce them during a reaction. You need two enzymes to make cystine leukotrienes. 
the way we measure your cystine leukotrienes down here is by measuring the levels of LTE4, which is the stable end metabolite we measure in your urine. In order to get there, through arachidonic acid, you first go through the 5-lipoxygenase enzyme. The 5-lipoxygenase enzyme then produces LTA4, which is this very unstable metabolite that has like a half-life of seconds in the blood. So if it gets into the blood, it com becomes completely inert very quickly. If you can then get through LTC4 synthase, you get to the parent cystine leukotriene called LTC4, which is then quickly metabolized into LDD4. And LTE4, that's the most stable one that we can measure. So the action of both of these enzymes are needed <clears throat> in order to get cystine leukotrienes. So here's a list of cells that have 5-lipoxygenase. Here's a box of cells that have leukotriene C4 synthase. So if you are a cell that has both of those things, eosinophils, mass cells, tissue, macrophages, or basophils, then if we feed you, if you will, arachidonic acid, you take your own 5-lipoxygenase enzyme, you make LTA4, you very quickly take your own LTC4, uh, LTC4 synthase enzyme and make um, LTC4, and voila, you have cystine leukotrienes. This is the classic intracellular, one cell production of cystine leukotrienes. If you are a neutrophil, you have 5-LO, you're in the top box, but you don't have LTC4 synthase, you're not in the bottom box. So if I give you arachidonic acid, you very quickly take your 5-lipoxygenase, you convert it into LTA4, and you have LTA4 hydrolase. You can make lots of LTB4, which is the thing that, that is uh, leukotriene that neutrophils make most, but you can't ever make LTC4, ever. You don't have LTC4 synthase. Turns out, ever, however, for neutrophils, that they have so much 5-lipoxygenase enzyme, they're very overfunctional, that about half of the LTA4 they make, they can't convert into LTB4 because they don't have enough of the enzyme. So they waste it. They spill half of their LTA4 into like the milieu around them in the blood. And again, it takes seconds to dissipate. So it's sort of useless. It's wasted. Down here in pink, if you are a platelet, you have no 5 alone. You have only LTC4 synthase. So if I feed a platelet arachidonic acid, this entire section of the pathway is totally quiescent. They can't do anything with it. If, however, I feed you LTA4 as a platelet, then you can use your LTC4 synthase, process it very quickly, and make lots of cystine leukotrienes. So a neutrophil alone can make LTA4, but not, not cystine leukotrienes. A plate alone can take LTA4, maybe even from a neutrophil, and make it into cystine leukotrienes. A neutrophil plus a platelet together become a machine that allows for a transcellular production of cystine leukotrienes that each cell on its own could never do. So there are three general abnormalities that we know of in this pathway that have been found in patients with AERD. One I already mentioned, their baseline LTE4 is high and is increases further during reactions. Two, it's been found that the quantity of LTC4 synthase enzyme in the eosinophils and their bronchial biopsies is actually higher than in aspirin tolerant asthmatics. So they seem to have more of this enzyme in there. And three, um, the main LTC4 receptor, the cis-LT1 receptor, is also found to be increased in their tissues. So there's something going on. Something's wrong with their leukotriene pathway. So one wonders, would drugs that inhibit leukotrienes help? The answer is usually. So they're really two to three-ish that we have available in the market in the United States. Xyluton is an inhibitor of that enzyme, the 5-LO enzyme. So it can actually completely block reactions, or it can at least shift the amount of aspirin you need to have a reaction if you're on it. And this is very useful if you want to block a reaction. That's great. It's less useful if you're on it, because that's one of those medications that if it, you take it regularly, I'll never know if you're allergic to aspirin or not, because it can block the reactions. The second is Montelukast, or Zafirlukast, similar medication that both block that SSLT1 receptor that's supposed to be the main cystilocotrine receptor. So these drugs actually work very well. They block the receptor very well. Very safe, single pill, once a day, popular medications. And they shift the reaction to the upper airways mostly. So it tends to make it safer. You have less lower respiratory reaction, less fallen FEV1. But it doesn't prevent the reaction. Almost never. Almost never. 10% of patients in this one study, it was 10 patients. So one patient had the reaction completely blocked on Montelukast. So we do keep that in the back of our minds. Could that block a reaction? But here's the thing. So Zyluton makes you better, but it doesn't totally cure you. Montelukast helps a little, especially with reactions, but it doesn't cure you. So leukotrienes are totally a problem in this disease, but they probably aren't the only problem. We should be able to fix that problem with the drugs we have, and we can't. So what other mediators are involved? All right, so now we move to the right-hand side. 
and we look at the COX-1 and COX-2 pathway. And we say COX-1, COX-2 as though they're the same enzyme, they aren't. COX-1 and COX-2 are actually quite different. So COX-1 is linked to the thromboxane synthase, and thromboxane is made predominantly by platelets and predominantly through COX-1. Whereas the COX-2 pathway produces many of the other prostaglandins, and the one that gets the most attention in ARD is PGE2, which once um, it's there, prostaglandin E2, it acts through one of its receptors, EP1 through 4. It turns out that this whole COX side and this whole lipoxygenase through a triene side don't act alone. They're all part of the same big party, and they counter-regulate each other. So PGE acting specifically through its EP2 receptor actually blocks the translocation and blocks the function of 5-LO. So lots of PGE prevents that leukotriene site from going through by preventing the 5-LO enzyme. So it might be of note then that the EP2 receptor expression levels in these patients have been found to be specifically lowered. EP1, 3, and 4 are fine. The EP2, the one you actually need, is low. It's been found both in their bronchial biopsies and in tissue from their nasal polyps. So, you know, here's this protective thing that you should have that should be able to act to prevent leukotrienes, and they don't have as much of that receptor they need. Could that be a problem for them? Also, two summers ago, it was found that the, the fibroblasts from their nasal polyps, if you grow them out of, their, um, out of their sinuses, don't produce as much PGE as you're supposed to. They have less COX-2 enzyme and less PGE. So their respiratory tissue seems to be less able to produce the PGE that you need to prevent leukotrienes, and they appear to have less of the receptor that the PGE2 needs to prevent leukotrienes. So the platelet, which is our new favorite thing, actually is also perhaps key here. So thromboxane, which comes really predominantly from the platelet, also acts on the leukotriene pathway. So thromboxane through the TP, thromboxane receptor, down-regulates LTC4 synthase activity. So two things from the COX side down-regulate the two key enzymes you need for leukotrienes. I feel like there's some kind of answer to one of the riddles in the disease, somewhere in this, that we've only partly figured out. All right, so the decreased COX-2, I explained from the nasal polyp fibroblast, decreased EP2 receptor, and question is from boxing involved. It does seem curious that aspirin, the reason cardiologists give you aspirin is because it blocks your thromboxane production. So it's some, there's some connection in there. We're gonna see. All right, so this is just an, a, it's my favorite study ever, so I have to show it all the time, of, of how we know that PGE and um, leukotrienes are important in the disease. So this is a, an Italian study done in 1996. So on the left, they took a bunch of patients and, with AERD and they either made them take aspirin or they had them inhale PGE like as, as though it was a nebulizer before taking aspirin. And in the folks down here in the dots, they inhaled the placebo, no PGE first, and took aspirin. This is what we do to our patients all the time. So, you know, 30 minutes after their aspirin challenge, their lung function had fallen by 15%. You know, three hours after the, two hours after the aspirin challenge, it had fallen by 30%. And you can tell they sort of stopped the challenge there because it got unsafe. Same patients brought back on a different day given PGE2 now to inhale, exact same protocol. It completely blocked their fall in FEV1, blocked the reaction. Not only did it block their wheezing and their sneezing and their reaction, it blocked the rise in leukotrienes that we see. So here's their baseline. And when you gave them just the placebo and they had their reaction, two hours later, their urinary leukotrienes are higher. Th four hours later, they're higher yet. But the patients who had the PGE2 first, LTE4 doesn't go up. So it's almost like this lovely in vivo picture of what happens when the PGE2, 3P2, blocks the production of leukotrienes. We learned PGE2 blocks the reaction, we learned PGE2 blocks LTE4, and we learned probably that LTE4 is what's causing the main part of these reactions from the study. But we have holes. So who's making leukotrienes? Where are they coming from? If I cheat and go backwards to, there we go, to the boxes, so the cells that can make cystine leukotrienes are eosinophils, mast cells, tissue ma macrophages, and basophils. There are more eosinophils in these patients, both in their blood and in their tissues. But there are more eosinophils in lots of other diseases, and they don't make tons of leukotrienes. So that can't in and of itself explain it. There really haven't been found to be vastly increased numbers of mast cells or abnormal tissue macrophages, and there are only like seven basophils in the whole body anyway. So it's just not clear who is making the leukotrienes. What's the abnormal cell here? All right, so back through. All right, so back to this thromboxane. And this is one of the most fun facts about platelets that I hadn't known before. So this is 
normal. This is what happens in your body and in my body. You take platelets from your peripheral blood and you feed them, just like I had said with the big white poster of the pathways, you feed them the LTA4, that unstable intermediate, and you let the platelets then convert the LTA4 into LTC4, and that's a, a measurement of their LTC4 synthase activity. So before you give them a, a thromboxane, this U46619 is a type of thromboxane, for example, that um, hits the TP receptor. Before you give them that, they have lots of LTC4 synthase activity. Minutes after hitting them with, them with thromboxane, that activity goes down. It diminishes their ability to use the, the leukotriene synthase enzyme. Meaning, right, so this is a normal plate, this is my platelet. My one platelet makes its own thromboxane, tons of it, and spills it out onto itself. Its own thromboxane then feeds back into its own LTC4 synthase activity and stops it from making leukotrienes. So the normal state of being of a platelet is to make lots of thromboxane and no leukotrienes. That's what it does to itself. That's normal. So how is that related to AERD? That's normal. It happens to everybody. I take aspirin all the time. I do not have a whopping asthma attack when I do. So what's different? How is that, how is that a role? So on the left is, uh, this is urinary leukotrienes at baseline patients who have aspirin tolerant asthma, just kind of Joe Schmo asthma, or AERD. And here's this whopping rise in their LTE4 that we see three hours after aspirin. Now here's the fall in thromboxane. Both patients with Joe Schmo aspirin tolerant asthma and AERD have their thromboxane fall three hours after aspirin. That's just because aspirin worked. That's what aspirin does. That's why we take it normally. Now, it did fall slightly further in the patients with AERD, but either way, these folks didn't have a reaction, and these did. What's going on? Why is that happening? And, and is this in any way related to the leukotrienes on the left? In the same urinary samples, we also can measure PGE2 metabolites. And you look at your ATAs, your aspirin tolerance. Three hours after aspirin, their PGE2 is rock stable. They don't care you gave them aspirin. They're doing just fine. Maybe they don't care that you gave them aspirin. That's why their PGE2 is just fine. And maybe because their PGE2 over here is just fine, that's why their leukotrienes didn't go up very much, because they were able to maintain that lower. But the folks with AERD had their PGE2 fall. Why is that? Why did theirs fall and others didn't? We don't know, but I think it's a clue. So because we know that a platelet attached to a neutrophil can make cystin leukotrienes when alone it can't. And because we know that there are tons of neutrophils out there and they have lots of 5 lipoxygenase enzyme, and because we know that there's this funky you know, thromboxane from the platelet inhibits uh, um, leukotrienes we think might be related, we learned that when platelets become activated for really any reason at all, they express something called an adhesion receptor called P-selectin on their surface. That adhesion receptor then allows them to attach onto leukocytes, onto other white blood cells. And once they bind, they bind really tightly. So activated platelets attach onto white blood cells, things like neutrophils. And you know, patients with AERD sort of live in a state of inflammation. It wouldn't shock people if their platelets were more activated than average. And so we started looking for whether or not we could find platelet leukocyte aggregates in patients with AERD. And turns out we could. We started in the nasal polyps. So here in the nasal polyps, we found on the left, here's lots of eosinophils that we are looking for, pretty pink cells. And on the right, very fancy staining, where in their tissue, if blue is a nucleus, so blue is a cell, green is a, what's called a CD45 receptor, which sort of uh, generally marks white blood cells of any form. And red is CD61, which is specific for a platelet. We found these areas where blue nucleus, this is a white blood cell, has lots of red attached to it. These aren't vessels. This is not platelets in the blood. This is platelets that appear to be attached to white blood cells in their tissues. And then we took a, a variety of these patients, four um, controls and six patients with AERD. We saw that the total numbers of these uh, you know, doubly attached cells, platelet attached cells, was more than double in patients with AERD in their nasal palms than patients who were aspirin tolerant. Problem being that nasal polyps are a little bit hard to come by sometimes, and we wanted to know which kind of cell we were looking at. And so we wanted to see if we could find the same thing in the blood. Turns out that you can draw blood, nice fresh blood, and you stain it with CD45 here by flow cytometry to figure out that it's a white blood cell. And within that, you can then gather which ones are lymphocytes, which ones are monocytes, and of the granulocytes, which are neutrophils and which are eosinophils. So now we have four cell populations we can identify pretty easily in the blood with actually only a few drops of blood. In addition to these, we can then stain them for CD61 to try to find a platelet. 
And so here is a patient who has aspirin tolerant asthma. So when we looked at her eosinophils up here to see how many of them also had a platelet attached, 15% did. 10% of her neutrophils, 15% of her, of her monocytes, and only a few lymphocytes. This gentleman with AARD, 76% of his eosinophils did. Three times as many eosinophils had platelets attached. 37% of, of his neutrophils did. And so when we did a bunch of patients, we noticed that in black here, our patients with AERD really have dramatically increased percentages of platelets attached to their eosinophils, their neutrophils, and their monocytes. So we started really thinking about these granulocytes specifically, especially the neutrophil. Because remember, the neutrophil alone we're not afraid of, a platelet alone we're not afraid of, but maybe a neutrophil plus a platelet, maybe we're afraid of that. Maybe that's where our leukotrienes could be coming from. So we wanted to know if there are functional consequences to having all these platelets attached to your neutrophils and whether or not they could be contributing to the production of cystine leukotrienes. In order to do that, we wanted to compare neutrophils, granulocytes that did have platelets, and those that didn't. Once that activated platelet attaches to the neutrophil, it's actually sort of hard to get it unattached. You have to gently trypsinize them to sort of rip off the platelets. So we did that. We took granulocytes, mostly neutrophils, and we either looked at them freshly isolated, so whatever platelets they happen to have in the body, or stripped of platelets, sort of the naked cell after we take the platelets off. And we did that same LTC4 synthase assay they had done with the, with the platelet. So we gave them LTA4 and we asked the question, how much LTA4 can you convert into LTC4 to, to um, let us know how active your enzyme is? And it turns out that we noticed a few things. First of all, even just these freshly isolated ones, the patients with AERD, their granulocytes converted almost three times as much LTA4. They had three times as much LTC4 synthase activity as did the aspirin tolerant patients. And then after stripping the platelets off, half of it was gone. Half of that LTC4 synthase activity was actually due to the platelet, not due to the granulocyte itself. There's still some left. We don't know if this is because we, had, we wouldn't get complete strippage or not, but we learned here that this granulocyte activity might actually be blamed on the platelet more appropriate. Looking at similar data, we wanted to know whether or not this might be true in a more endogenous system. So we actually took the cells and then um, gave them what's called um, calcium ionophore to kind of kick them, to stimulate them, and simply saw how many leukotrienes they produced. And the trend was exactly the same. So at baseline, the patients with AERD produced three times as much leukotrienes under the same cells as those with um, aspirin tolerant asthma. And when you ripped off the, cell, the platelets, it went down by half. When we looked at everything that came out of the 5-lipoxygenase enzyme, including things like LTB4, the same trend was true. They produced more 5-lipoxygenase products overall, and it went down after removing the platelets. So this is my example of what I think is going on in you. This is what happens. So normally speaking, your leukotriene production is very tightly regulated with platelets and neutrophils happily not coexisting, right? Neutrophils are on the left, platelets are floating around on the right. They don't talk to each other. Okay, so you have PGE2 being produced. It acts through your EP2 receptor. It blocks 5-LO. You don't make any of that enzyme, that um, LTA4 stuff. You have lots of thromboxane being produced by platelets. It downregulates the LTC4 synthase in them themselves. And if there was any LTA4 around, they don't have any LTC4 synthase activity to convert it to LTC4 anyway. Then you take aspirin. It blocks COX-1 in everyone. You get less thromboxane. It's supposed to. So your thromboxane goes down. We know that in normal regulation, it means that your LTC4 synthase goes up. All right, fine. But, but you are able to maintain your PGE2 levels because you have lots of COX-2 hanging around. It's fine. Your EP2 signaling is still there. You're able to keep your 5-LO blocked. So no LTA4 is produced. So frankly, Nobody cares that your LTC4 synthase activity went up in the platelet because there's no LTA4 to convert anyway. It doesn't make any difference. Your aspirin doesn't hurt you. Your LTC4 and your LTE4 stay constant. That's you. This is them. So now, instead, their neutrophils have platelets attached to them. So problem number one is that you produce less L um, PGE at baseline and you have less EP2 for it to act, for, uh, act through. And so some LTA4 is made. And it's passed to platelets at baseline. There is more leukotriene out there in them. There is still, however, a platelet doing its job the way it's supposed to. It, down it makes thromboxane, it downregulates LTC4 synthase. Only some of the LTA4 is converted to LTC4. So we have some leukotrienes produced. Now you take aspirin. It blocks COX-1. 
thromboxane decreases, its LTC4 synthase activity goes up. But now, you don't have as much of the COX-2 enzyme as you're supposed to, and your PGE2 goes down too. So decreased PGE2 plus you have less of the EP2 sitting that have been found in the tissues. Now your 5-LO loses that blockade that it needs. Lots of LTA4 is made. It's spilled out onto attached platelets. And now those attached platelets, because the aspirin decreased their thromboxane production, now they have lots of enzyme. And they go nuts and they produce LTC4 and LTE4, and you get a whopping reaction. That's what I think happens during the reactions. Knowing this, we got a little upset with platelets, and we wanted to try to find a way to maybe block them, to maybe prevent some of this from happening. So we're going to shift gears into the clinical trial. And so we're trying to target platelets by targeting one of their main receptors called P2I12. It's an ADP receptor. It actually has homology to some of the leukotriene receptors. And conveniently, we have a couple of really good, nice, relatively low side effect profiled FDA-approved medications that treat it. Cardiologists love these medications. So we thought, would P2Y12 inhibition, would inhibiting the platelet with one of these drugs reduce the leukotriene production? Well, it turns out that inhibiting P2Y12 reduces platelet leukocyte aggregates. It generally kind of reduces the activity of the platelet. So if the platelet doesn't express its adhesion receptor, it then won't adhere onto leukocytes. And so you get fewer of those. So if we think that we're blaming some of these platelet leukocyte aggregates for the production of leukotrienes, then decreasing them could be a good thing. It also turns out that, a little bit unrelated to that, the receptor itself, P2Y12, may somehow be involved in LTE4 producing inflammation. And so blocking it, either by using medication to block P2Y12 or by taking a mouse and completely knocking out the entire gene for P2Y12, prevents LTE4 from causing inflammation. And here's the data that kind of back that up. So these are patients, human patients, who were either on aspirin, and here's the bummer, aspirin itself actually doesn't decrease the production of um, platelet leukocyte aggregates. So that isn't the explanation of why aspirin works. That would have been cool. So here you are, you're on aspirin, you are, sorry, here, you're an untreated patient, and this is a measure of how many platelet leukocyte aggregates you have. So higher is worse. Um, aspirin is not significantly lower than being untreated, but clopidogrel, which is a famous P2Y12 inhibitor, is. So you have like half as many platelet um, leukocyte aggregates if you're on clopidogrel or Plavix. Now if I stimulate your ADP receptor to really activate your platelets and get lots of things to attach, it works. If you're only on aspirin or, you or you're completely untreated, but if you're on clopidogrel, you don't make more. So this was kind of exciting. We could prevent this thing we thought we were trying to blame for leukotriene production. Out of the mouse model in Josh Boyce's lab, they also found that you can uh, block a lot of the inflammation caused by LTE4 in the lung by blocking P2Y12. So I'll just walk you through one slide here. This is PAS staining of um, goblet cells. This is mucus production. This is sort of a, how much snot is in your lung, right? So pink is more snot, bad. At the top here, we have um, uh, sensitized and challenged with OVA alone. If you add LTE4, you get lots of pink goblet cell snot in your lung. If you do the exact same thing, but before you give them LTE4, you gave them that clopidogrel that blocked P2I12, you don't. This was very encouraging. They did a very similar set of experiments with a set of mice that don't have P2Y12, and you couldn't get LTE4 to cause inflammation if you didn't have P2Y12. So now we have two reasons of thinking this P2Y12 might be a cool target. And thus is born the clinical trial, designed by Dr. Boyce and Dr. Israel. So we're doing a couple of things with this trial. One, we're trying to figure out whether or not blocking P2Y12 makes a difference. Two, we're trying to figure out why aspirin works for anyone, because that's an answer, that's a question that really no one has been able to answer. So part one is this double blind placebo controlled crossover, where it got a little bit messed up on the slide. Regardless, for the first um, four weeks, the first month, you take Prasagrel, which is like Clopidogrel, it blocks P2Y12. And then we give you an aspirin challenge, an aspirin desensitization, and we essentially see how sick you get. We want to measure your lung function. We want to measure how much leukotriene gets into your, um, into your urine. We want to measure how severe your reaction is. Then you wash out and you go on placebo. Four weeks later on placebo, we do the exact same thing in the same exact very stereotyped way with a second aspirin desensitization, and we compare how sick you are. Which, on which one were you worse? Ideally, if this works, it means that when you're on placebo, you'll get sicker than when you were on Prasagrel. 
We have lots of biochemical markers that we're changing, that we're uh, measuring in there as well. So this whole, these two sections in here don't help the patient in any way. We don't pretend that they do. It's a gift to science, to research, and for everyone else on the planet who has the disease. This first aspirin challenge and desensitization does not help them at all. At the end of that day, they go home not on aspirin. They gave that day to us. The second one is the one they would have done anyway. And so at the end of that day, they get desensitized to aspirin just like they wanted to for their own health, and they go home on high-dose aspirin for eight weeks, just as they would have. They come back eight weeks later, and we see them again. We try to figure out, are you better? If so, why? We do all the same measurements we do in the blood, in the urine. We do lots of lung function tests. We would like to get two answers. One, why does aspirin make you better? What's different two months later than you were at the start? And two, the numbers that I quoted from before, something like 80% of people get better when they're on aspirin. So who's in the 20? And can I tell that at the outset? Because if I can save people some really dangerous aspirin desensitizations that are never going to help them ever, it'd be nice. So the primary objectives of the trial are to figure out whether or not blocking P2I12 receptors in a double-blind placebo-controlled trial attenuates the reactions, and to see whether or not blocking those P2I12 receptors on platelets makes any difference. And the second part, the objective of part two, is to try to get a sense of whether or not the effect of desensitization and treatment um, with aspirin has to do with levels of COX-2, has to do with PGE2 um, mediation, to get some senses of that. In the last couple of minutes, I'm going to throw out what else is going on in the world of AERD. What are the targets that are being studied right now? What do I think should be studied? So omalizumab, anti-IgE monoclonal antibody, we all know that it doesn't necessarily just block allergic reactions. It's sort of an anti-inflammatory medication in lots of ways. And so I said at the beginning, this is not an IgE-mediated disease per se. There still might be a role for omalizumab. Mepolizumab, which is anti-IL-5 and can prevent some of the eosinophils from living and growing. We know that eosinophils um, that exist in their um, sinus tissues might be good to get rid of. Right, so why does aspirin work? That would be nice. Are there any dietary modifications? So one of the tricks to arachidonic acid um, that is at the top of the mediator list is that you can't make arachidonic acid through your own endogenous amino acids. You have to eat certain amino acids that have it in them. And so if we could remove those from the diet or shift it a little, could we shift you sort of more naturally away from making leukotrienes? Um, I haven't gotten into it and I won't, but there is likely one, if not two, maybe even three, more LTE4 receptors that are being worked on and discovered in the last couple of years. And because Montelukast and Zafirlukast that block that CIS-LT1 receptor are great drugs, but don't cure this disease, there must be something else that LTE4 is doing. Is there another receptor out there that we could block that would make that extra difference for them? And mesoprostol, I'll go over in a second. So in Elizabeth, there are a couple of studies that have shown maybe some beneficial effects. Um, unfortunately, they were very small patient, um, patient groups. So there were 12 patients who had ARD, eight got the drug, four got placebo. And it did seem to help, but I'm not sure that that's enough to make a huge um, conclusion from that. And there are a couple of ongoing trials, including one at Mass Journal with Dan Himmelis right now. Mepolizumab. So this was 30 patients. The problem is that uh, they took all comers with severe nasal polyps, five of which they thought had, five of whom they thought had AERD, and all five got put on mepolizumab. That's just how the randomization showed up. And so, frankly, I'm not really sure that we can tell anything about whether or not that worked because there was no placebo control for them. But I think it's a good idea to pursue it. Aspirin. So we have the one that we're doing, trying to figure it out. Use aspirin and see why it makes you better and how. Um, and they're also looking at mass general to see what happens in the metabolomics of the reactions to aspirin. I think we could know more about those reactions. That would be good. So dietary modifications, I'll spend two seconds on what's out there if you Google it, called the low salicylate diet. I hate this diet. I don't know where it came from. It's a super not healthy diet. Salicylates are in raw fruits and vegetables. Right? It's what we all should eat more of. And they're not bad for you at all. So this is salicylate. This is acetyl salicylic acid. They do sound the same. I get it. Like I get that there's some, some familiarity. But it's the acetyl group on the aspirin that, that causes the reactions. You need to acetylate the COX um, enzyme to get a reaction. So salicylic acid alone, not dangerous, not bad stuff, doesn't scare me. Luckily, someone is doing a study out there, I think, I haven't heard much about their um, recruitment, to actually prove that it does or does not work. I think they're probably trying to prove that it does work. I'm really hoping they prove that it doesn't work. It's a bad diet and it doesn't work. Don't do it. But there is this concept of, you know, I'm not at all averse to, to a 
dietary changes that could make a difference to our environmental milieu. And so omega-3 fatty acid supplementation or decreasing the ratio of omega-6 to omega-3 fatty acids to try to shift away from the arachidonic acid pathway kind of curious about that. There's a little bit of early data to say that it might matter, and I'm starting to talk to my patients a bit about what dietary changes might make biologic sense for them, though we don't yet have data to back it up. That would be something we would like to do someday. Misoprostol exists. It's a really old drug. It's been around for decades. It's a PGE1 analog. It almost like fakes out the PGE system, and I could see it working beautifully for lots of things. It um, has a lot of side effects. It gives you really bad diarrhea, and it also causes abortion. So it's going to be a hard sell, um, and I think it's, uh, it could teach us about the disease, but it's not the kind of thing that's going to be a go-to cure for this disease. And then if we figure out the LTE4 receptor and we can inhibit it, it could make a big difference. All right. So on this slide are lots of people I need to thank for having helped us. And if you combine the knowledge of all of these brains in one room, probably you would actually, in that room, know everything that is known about this disease. Everything in one room with these brains. Which should be encouraging. Except for what Nora Barrett said to me a few months ago when she was encouraging me to not quit in some day where like, research was failing. She said, Tanya, we need you guys to keep doing research because we don't know anything. And it's really embarrassing when I talk to my patients and I have nothing to tell them. And I realized that she was right because when I meet my patients, this is what I sort of would have liked it to be, or someday would like it to be. I'd like to be able to meet a new patient, spend a whole hour with them, getting to know their history, talking to them, and trying to make them better. At the end, they will have come away with, hi, welcome to our team. You have an unusual disease that can be frustrating and fascinating and sometimes debilitating, but you've come to the right place. We have a room full of experts. We know everything there is that is known about AERD. We will help you. We will care for you, and we'll make you better. I think probably what they come away with at the end of the full hour with me is, welcome. You have a debilitating and frustrating disease. I don't know why you got it. I don't know why you still have it. I don't know why, despite high doses of inhaled steroids, you wake up every night gasping for breath. I don't know why at the age of 32, you've already had five polyp surgeries. I don't know why aspirin makes you sick. I have no idea why I can desensitize you to it. And no one's even tried to figure out why aspirin can make you better. So we have a lot more work to do. Thank you. Thank you very much. That's outstanding and incredibly clear. Thank you. We're ready for uh, questions. For any questions or comments from the audience? I just want to say thank you, Tanya. This is wonderful. And I remember my days when I was a fellow and doing those aspirin challenges in clinic. And you had the incubation to yeah. 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 I think yeah. it would be very rough. Uh, no, this is marvelous how the field has a dance in your hands. And, and, and I have a quick question about what you were thinking in terms of the patients who uh, have this and don't take aspirin. They still have the robotrons that are elevated. Are they eating those salicylates or is it an intrinsic problem that we still don't know what to tell about? And my second quick question is when Elliot Israel and I meet some of the nasal laboratories, we found good days in the nasal yeah. practice. And yeah. so, uh, you know, Marcel is out of the wagon at this moment, but maybe there is a point. Can you repeat the question? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So the first question had to do with why in the absence of aspirin or COX-1 inhibitors are they sick at baseline? Why are their leukotrienes still high? And the super short answer is we don't know. So it might be because the leukotrienes are coming from a state of inflammation. It might be because there's an intrinsic defect in their arachidonic acid production. We don't know yet. Why is it that even in the absence of those reactions, they have those high levels? And then the second one is the, the question about mast cells, which I think is increasingly, we're trying to make it trendy again, because I do think that the mast cells may play a role here. Mast cells are really hard to study because they only exist in the tissues and in very low numbers. But a single mast cell can do a ton of damage. They're very, very powerful cells in the allergic immune system. And they certainly do exist in these patients, in their nasal polyps, and in their lungs. We don't know carefully if they're in higher levels in ARD than they are in, in aspirin tolerant patients, but they might actually be. And there have been nasal lavage findings of higher levels of tryptase that can only come from mast cell. And there have actually been higher levels of baseline tryptase found in some ARD patients. And they're also, interestingly, during reactions, in some patients, their tryptase levels will go way up. 
They don't classically anaphylax. They don't have hives. They don't need intubation. But during these really awful reactions, their trypases can go up. Um, one paper even showed a level of 40 for one patient. Really classic, very high levels of tryptase. And those patients that get the high levels of tryptase during their reactions are the ones who have extra pulmonary symptoms in addition to their respiratory reactions. So it tends to be the patients who get rash and the bad GI side effects during their reaction. Their tryptase levels seem to go up. I don't know why. Josh? Yeah, just to add a little uh, bonus to that point, and again, congratulations on the presentation. Um, but uh, back even before Marianne and I got to the division, uh, people used to uh, prophylax folks with uh, uh, chromolytic. Yeah, that's right. Yep. And it actually worked very nicely with blocking the reaction, it worked as well as the pilot. Yeah. So there, I, I, I do think the mast cell is circulating around something, we need to figure it out. Yeah. Yikes. So thinking about acute inflammation where people have neutrophilia and high platelet counts, mm -hmm. is there any signal from the clinical side that patients are worse off when or they have more extreme reactions in times of uh, acute inflammation? Say they have thinking a that, yep. mother infection, flu, whatever, where they have a their neutrophil count may triple, their platelet count may double. Like, would we have caught them at a time when they have even more of those leukocyte yeah, aggregates? More severe reactions when they can have. More. Yeah. So the question being, are increasing states of inflammation because of infection or other illness that might then correlate with increasing neutrophils or platelet counts and might also correlate with increasing platelet and neutrophil um, aggregates cause worsening reactions? So Again. Increased yeah. Yeah, 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 certainly. Um, that would be a very hard study to do, no, and it would be anecdotal, right? So I'm trying to I'm trying to think of an anecdote where someone was sort of sicker than usual. I don't know, I don't know that I can say that. And what we haven't done well, and that I think is is being begged to be done, is to look at other states of inflammation, right? So we compare our patients to patients with aspirin tolerant asthma, equally bad asthma, but one could argue that maybe they have less inflammation. Maybe doing this in you know bad rheumatoid arthritis patients or something who have other levels of inflammation to check to see how important those platelet aggregates are. I don't know. We haven't done that. So I just want to say, uh, the tubic sinus surgeries, uh, 20 years of sinus infections, uh, we lost their big liver out of the tube, used two, three different inhalers, uh, had allergy shots for twice a month for 10 years, and for the last year and a half, because I take two aspirin at night and two aspirin in the morning uh, with any of those weeks. So allergy shock, and that's not those no symptoms for the first time in uh, almost 20 years, I guess not. She's a success story. <laughs> that doesn't always work that well, but it did for her. She also, I have to say, put up with a pretty difficult reaction to aspirin. Which I didn't know I was allergic to because I had no reason See? Yep. She had to uh, trust in me that, no, 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 really, I think you might, yeah. And, uh, along that lines, could you give us some of your hypotheses about what the gas is doing that means that these two weeks would like to go into the or six months? Yeah, six yeah. So what do I think aspirin's doing? <laughs> what, what are my completely un, unsubstantiated and untested theories? Um, and do I think it takes eight weeks? Uh, eight weeks is the period that we chose because it's sort of long enough to get a sense of how you're going to feel. I'm not convinced that it takes eight weeks, um, but I don't know. Anecdotally, so aside from the, the study I showed from Don Stevenson where they said 67% of patients after six months and 80% or whatever after 12 months, Frankly, I don't make patients stay out that long to figure it out. I think you're going to know after a few weeks if it's going to help you. Um, and the success stories um, will know after a week. So I'll get an email or a phone call three days later saying, oh my god, I just felt tuna fish for the first time in 10 years. And they know quite quickly. So whatever it is, I think it probably happens quickly, but that's pure anecdote. And the since we have zero data at all, I can totally throw out a theoretical thing. Um, my theory is that there is an epigenetic change in the tissue, either because of an inhalant toxin or an inhalant of virus or an inhalant hit, I don't know. But I think something got in there, nose and lungs, and maybe GI tract a little, which can be along the same lines. 
And once it's there, it's either stayed there permanently or it's made a permanent epigenetic change. So the genomic DNA hasn't changed, but the way the DNA is read is changed. And although aspirin acetyl salicylic acid acetylates COX-1 and COX-2, and that's how it inhibits them, it actually also acetylates other things, less famous for doing so. It can acetylate things like histones, and it can affect some epigenetic mechanisms. It hasn't been well studied at all, except for in a couple of cancers where there's no epigenetic mechanisms. And the reason I'm throwing that out there is because we do know that the other COX-1 inhibitors that cause the reactions, ibuprofen, Aleve, Tordal, um, they cause a reaction. So we know the, co- the reaction is because of their COX-1 inhibition. They don't make you better. So I can desensitize you to, to ibuprofen and put you on a lot of ibuprofen and your arthritis will be better, but your nasal polyps won't. So the mechanism of the reaction is COX-1 inhibition. The mechanism of aspirin making you better isn't. The other reason we know that is because COX-1 is inhibited at like 160 milligrams. You should not need 1,200 milligrams of aspirin to make you better if it has anything to do with the COX system. So I think it's probably an unknown unknown. Still. Are there loci that are, that you guess for acetylation that are hypothesized by the aspirin? Yeah. Yes. There are are loci that we suspect that aspirin can acetylate and could then affect the DNA reading. Yeah. I I would add to that that there's uh, some evidence based entirely on the in transcription factor assays that aspirin in high doses will inhibit stent things and will also inhibit NF-CAP-T. And presumably that's through acetylation because you can get it to happen uh, with uh, uh, sodium salicylate mm-hmm. um, and it has nothing to do with the cyclooxygenase yep. function. Whereas the reaction Does. clearly has to do with the cyclooxygenase uh, reaction based on the uh, dose that's required to cause reaction. Thank Thank you. Thank you again.